Jean Kelly. Today on Straight Talk Africa, a report card on the challenges of democracy and social justice in Africa. That discussion is coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I am Shaka Sali, and today we are discussing the process of democratic transitions on the continent, and we'll explore the challenges that lie ahead. Africa has seen a decline in the number of authoritarian leaders since 2010. Multiple countries witnessed significant political changes due to popular uprisings, but the number of democracies has not noticeably increased. My colleague, Paul Rondiho, has more on the story. The Africa Center for Strategic Studies that says a large number of African governments are in a democratizing stage and still have a long way to go. It's a new era in Sudan. Abdel Fattah Abrahan is the new chairman of Sudan's newly formed Sovereign Council. Nine other members were also sworn in at the presidential palace in Khartoum. The Sovereign Council was the result of tense negotiations between the countries of pro-democracy leaders of mass protests, which erupted last December against the three-decade rule of former President Omar al-Bashir and the generals who ousted him in April. Political analysts say Western-style liberal democracy is being tested especially in countries where some of the world's longest-serving leaders continue to hold power. President Teodol Obiang Nguema Mbasogo of Equatorial Guinea has ruled for 40 years since August 1979. In Cameroon, 85-year-old President Paul Beer extended his 36-year rule. In 2008, the Cameroonian parliament voted to change the constitution to remove term limits so President Bia would be eligible to extend his time in office. Incumbent President Yori Museveni of Uganda is still going strong. In December 2017, Uganda's parliament voted to lift the age limit for the presidency, setting the stage for Yori Museveni to rule indefinitely. Museveni changed the constitution in 2005 to abolish the presidential term limits. Idris Deby has ruled Chad for 28 years. He won a fifth term in 2016 and without term limits, he could keep running until he dies. In Congo, Brazzaville, Dennis Sasson Wesso repealed term limits in 2015 and was re-elected on March 2016 for another seven-year term. In 2017, Rwandan President Paul Kagame won with nearly 100% of the vote, securing a third term in office. Kagame's re-election followed a constitutional amendment which ended a two-term limit allowing him to remain in power until 2034. Across in Burundi, Perry Nkuruziza is also widely expected to take advantage of the recent changes to the constitution that would ideally allow him to stay in office until 2034. Perhaps more importantly, not all of Africa is dealing with the lack of democracy syndrome. Other countries are building stronger governance and leadership institutions. Ethiopia is rebranding and building stronger institutions. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has embarked on a series of reforms. Elsewhere, tens of millions of Africans are using the ballot box to deepen the quality of democratic governance and bring about political transitions. On January 24, 2019, Felix Kisekedi was sworn in as the Democratic Republic of Congo's president, marking the country's first ever peaceful handover of power after multiple bitterly disputed elections. <laughs> 
in Senegal, our President Amaki Sall easily won re-election. Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari easily won re-election in 2019. New South African President Cyril Ramaphosa is vowing to create jobs and to tackle deeper rooted corruption. Malawian President Peter Arthur Mutarika was sworn in for a second term after a contentious election marred by allegations of fraud and vote rigging. Finally, Liberian President George Weir and the President of Sierra Leone, Julius Madabio, were both democratically elected through an open and transparent process. Paul Diho, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Joining me today are two distinguished guests. Kenneth Mwenda, a former Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and Professor of Law at the University of Pretoria in South Africa and in New York. We are joined by Cyril Obi, a Nigerian political scientist who is Program Director of the Africa Initiatives at the Social Science Research Council in New York. I have to say, uh, Dr. Mwenda and uh, Dr. Obi, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the two of you on Straight Talk Africa. You're most welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. You're most welcome. And for you, Obi, of course, uh, this is the first time uh, you are appearing on Straight Talk Africa. You are most welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Let me begin immediately with you, uh, uh, Dr. Mwenda. What is democracy? Uh, democracy apparently comes from a Greek language. It's uh, a Greek term meaning rule of the simple people. Correct. Um, there are many definitions of democracy, and uh, there are various types of democracies. For example, uh, you could have a constitutional democracy like what you have in South Africa or you can have what we call participatory democracy where the people are involved in um, indirectly uh, getting to influence decisions. There's also direct democracy where the people are actually directly involved in decision making. So there are various strands of democracy uh, but the key thing about democracy is there are certain tenets which are really fundamentally universal. For example, universal. Yes, for example, due process of the law, which comes from and is inspired by the Magna Carta in the United Kingdom. The Magna Carta? Yes. Uh, you have that is the Great Charter. The Great Charter, exactly. What does, actually, what does that mean, really? The Magna Charter was an agreement which was signed in 1215 uh, by uh, King John in England. And uh, it was in instigated to do so by the barons of England, uh, in particular, uh, the noble women and men and the lords mm. uh, in England uh, were agitated by the fact that he was constantly, uh, uh, you know, taking decisions which would offend the law and customs and traditions in the UK. So they said, look, the excesses of this, uh, what we call an absolute monarchy, were too much. But so it was meant really to benefit the elite. Exactly. That's why I said the barons. You Not know. the simple people. Uh, initially, exactly. But later on, if you look at the, the Magna Carta, it has inspired almost, I would say, a large number of constitutions in the English-speaking world, including European countries mm. and the U.S. Mm. They've all been inspired by the Magna Carta. When you talk of human rights, the, the first evidence of sort of documented human rights evidence comes from the Magna Carta right. in the English-speaking world. Uh, so a lot of African countries, today we're discussing Africa, and we have a lot of English-speaking African countries that have been inspired by the Magna Carta. Uh, so it forms the bedrock of tenets of democracy. Uh, now, within democracy, you will have other things like, you know, the right to education, okay? These are things which, in the past, were not heavily... Because if you look at democracy, there are various schools of thought. The neoliberal school of thought of mm -hmm. democracy, which the leftists will call bourgeois democracy, mm -hmm. is basically to say that the politicians are there to serve interest of the ruling class. Uh, so that's a vision of democracy. Right. But underlying that is the concept of, uh, you know, uh, human rights, governance, and transparency. And that's why today we're also talking of things like open government. The people need to have access mm. to data to mm. be able to hold the government accountable. Very this issue of security and secrecy arguments is, is no longer holding. We are moving into a new era of transparency at a global stage. Very interesting. Uh, what about you, uh, Dr. Obi, 
Do you agree with uh, Dr. Kenneth Mwenda? Yes, I do, largely. Um, I think the whole issue that could be added is to speak to the spirit of democracy. That democracy is designed to protect people against tyranny and to give them a voice and sovereignty in terms of being the ones who decide, who have a freedom, a free right to choose who rules them. And there are some world in their various countries are represented through the vote. So therefore, elections are a critical aspect of democracy as a system of representative government for the people, by the people. And it is a government that is ideally accountable to the people that elect it. And the, the inbuilt mechanisms against tyranny mean that there is always a periodic uh, renewal of the mandate freely given by the people to ensure accountability, to ensure transparency, to ensure that rights are protected, to also ensure that um, there is the ability of the people to change leaders if the leaders are not reflecting their interests or taking into consideration their basic or fundamental human rights. So I would say that that really is that the spirit of democracy is one which is founded upon the principle of freedom, freedom of choice, protection by law of property, property rights, and freedom of people to hold diverse opinions without unnecessarily being subjected to abuse or any violation of their rights. So that would be uh, democracy. The other dimension of democracy is that it is often expressed through political institutions and the principles of the separation of powers, whereby ideally there will be three arms of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, which are designed to balance out each other. However, in practice, uh, the ideal may not always be the norm, but it still coheres with the principle that um, a political system is protected against tyranny, so that it's not the rule of one or the few, but actually, ideally, the rule of all. You mentioned, among other things, that uh, democracy is a government of the people, by the people, for the people, which is pretty much also what uh, a former great American president, Abraham Lincoln, actually once said. And that seems to tally with uh, uh, what the term democracy means in Greek, which is a government of the simple people. Uh, but what about others who actually say that uh, what we are seeing in African democracies in practice, not all of them, some of the countries, is what they characterize as a government of some people, by some people, for some people. How do you react to that? Oh, thank you very much. I would say that there are various strands, as my colleague earlier mentioned. But more fundamentally is the fact that democracy is a continuous process. It's a work in progress. And so there is really no end point, so to speak. And so all countries of the world are on a journey, but admittedly, some are far further ahead of others in this transition from authoritarian forms of government to open and democratic forms of government. But there are three perspectives to what is happening to democracy in Africa. But before I go into this, I'll tell you that 
Um, democracy in the world is currently in, in retreat, and this is exemplified by the Freedom House's latest report, titled Democracy in Retreat. And so Africa, as a part of the world, seems to be not immune from the challenges that democracy is facing across the world. Uh, that's the first point. Now, secondly, I would say that there are various perspectives. Some people feel, and I think rightly so, that the quality of democracy in Africa is declining. Uh, the point to corruption, the point to political violence, the point to the ways incumbents in office or in power are able to manipulate political institutions, electoral institutions, security institutions to perpetrate themselves in power, or what some people called third termism. And they, they are really very worried that democracy in Africa is in a major crisis and may return Africa to a past where there was military rule or where you had a lot of chaos. That's one school of thought. There is another school of thought that says on the balance that what we have is mixed. There are some African countries that are actually stable and have held elections and have actually changed governments peacefully using the instrument of elections. And they also point to organizations like the African Union and other regional economic communities who have insisted that having a democratic regime is a condition for being a member of those organizations. And whenever people seize power unconstitutionally, they have automatically uh, suspended them. This is of very serious symbolic value. Thirdly, are those who say, yes, there is a crisis, a political crisis. There is a crisis of democracy. But let's look beneath this crisis and begin to see opportunities for democratic openings. When you look at the role of young people and social movements in countries like Senegal, in countries like Burkina Faso, the current uprisings in Algeria, the protests in Sudan, you begin to see some alternative opening that is being uh, generated on the continent. And Africa is actually unique in several ways in the sense that you have this paradoxical situation where some people are expressing a kind of despair that democracy is, grow is going under. And yet, you also have those people who are observing that in spite of this cloudy picture, there are sparks of hope coming up from time to time that show that there is an alternative that is possible and that that alternative is actually led and expressed by the majority of the people. And I'm happy that you made the point about the role of social media, uh, the whole question of uh, the data, and you can see that we are beginning to see a situation whereby young people, social movements from one country to the other are able, are able to express their will, even if this is not translated into elections and political power. But there is something going on in Africa that the world must pay close attention to. And lastly, is that democracy does not take place in a vacuum. There is a sociocultural context. There is the economic context, but more fundamentally, there is a global context. And within the global context, Africa has to thrive. And we need to pay attention to that global context very carefully. There are changes taking place in the world. What signals are these changes uh, sending to, to the various democratic forces which are struggling uh, within the continent? Uh, and I think I'll stop here for the moment. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mwenda, yes. uh, we again go back to uh, the term democracy, Correct. which is defined uh, in the Greek language 
as the rule over the simple people. You hear often uh, African leaders, uh, some might call them rulers, uh, talk about uh, how power in fact belongs to the people. Right. But at the end of the day, who are these people? Great question, Shaka. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, definitions of democracy, like I said, stated, they varied, but the common one is, you know, democracy is the rule of the people, for the people, and by the people, and that was by a former American president. Uh, that's been widely cited. And then, as you rightly said, the word democracy is driven, actually, it's borrowed from Greek language. There are actually two words which form democracy uh, as one. Um, but the question of who are the people when our leaders say, you know, the people chose me, the people said I should proceed. Uh, it's really a reflection of interest of the elites, uh, the aristocrats, uh, so to speak, so oligarchs in, in the Eastern European context. For in example. some ways, really, just like uh, the founding of the Magna Carta. Right. In, indeed, and that is why, if, if you recall earlier on, I pointed out that there's what we call neoliberal democracy or bourgeois democracy, mm -hmm. where politicians represent interests of the bourgeoisie or the ruling class. Mm. Uh, so that's a leftist sort of Marxist approach to, to, to the concept of democracy. But by and large, what is very important, I, I pointed out issues of due process of the law, the rule of law. Uh, those are some of the tenets of democracy that wherever you go in the world, mm. you cannot dispute that you need to have the rule of law, you need to have uh, transparency, you need to have due process of the law. Right. And those concepts come from the Magna Carta. That's the bedrock of democracy. Those are universal yeah. values are universal, as far as know, democracy is concerned. Yes. Now, when we talk about uh, the Magna Carta, it was obviously established uh, in what we know as the United Kingdom. Correct. What about the fact that uh, this United Kingdom we talk about, talk about democracy, talk about constitutionalism, actually happens to have the distinction of probably being the only country that I know of which does not have <laughs> a written constitution. You know, the, the British system, the English system, follows what we call uh, parliamentary supremacy. Uh, so parliament is supreme, uh, whereas like, the US, for example, is, the constitution is supreme. So an act of parliament uh, in the UK uh, is supreme, cannot be challenged. However, because of accession to EU, you have now legal jurisprudence that's coming from the EU courts, for example, uh, which now supersede uh, decisions of uh, British courts, because that's at a regional level. And there's a body of human rights uh, coming into the European Human Rights uh, Court. Uh, so we have to take cognizance of that fact. And there are a lot of customs and traditions which have been built in the systems mm. through decisions of the House of Lords uh, and uh, in enactments of, um, of Parliament. So the British system really, like I said, the Westminster model follows uh, what we call parliamentary supremacy. Much of what we have in Commonwealth Africa is a blend of the Westminster model and the American system. Mm -hmm. In the UK, uh, the prime minister is the head of government. That's what we had in Zimbabwe in 1980 when Robert Mugabe became prime minister. Mm -hmm. Kenan Banana was president. Because there's a parliamentary system. Exactly. Uh, so, but along the way, Zimbabwe shifted to a presidential system of government like Zambia and the rest of them, and Malawi and so forth. And the two, exactly. the prime and minister and president. So you have a blend of, of, of two traditions here. And in addition to that, you also have indigenous traditions of the Africans themselves, uh, which then creates uh, some sort of uh, mixed culture of traditions within the constitutional jurisprudence of these countries. So an African president almost really becomes an emperor. I wouldn't say so. Um, what Who we, checks him? Yeah, the, the challenge that we have is having strong institutions to provide checks and balances. Uh, but, but we don't have those yeah, strong for institutions example, so far uh, in most of... Uh, the I'll, African countries. Yes, I'll give a typical example. Uh, in the U.S., for example, the president can appoint a judge to the Supreme Court. He has that constitutional right to do so. In Africa, the presidents in some countries, yes, the constitution allows them to appoint judges, but the question Actually, is... Actually, the U.S. president will not appoint, will nominate. Right, nominate. Yes. And then the Senate. The Senate will, yes. Yes. But in the... Well, we have similar traditions in most of African countries. But the, the challenge that we have here, there are not effective checks and balances which will still protect the judiciary, even though the nomination came from the president. You talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the British democratic system, which, of course, uh, is a reflection of the parliamentary system. Correct. But what about the fact that uh, when you look at what is happening because of Brexit, for example, earlier today, right. the prime minister, Boris Johnson, 
essentially asked the Queen in her capacity as head of state to suspend parliament. The, the is British, that a democracy? Well, the, the, the British system, like, like I said, um, the Queen is a titular head. Uh, it's an, she's a nominal figure uh, in, the, in the UK. So the executive powers rest at downtown, 10 down. But the she's the head of state. But she, she's a titular, nominal head of state. It, the government, in fact, is called Her Majesty's government. Yeah, including all territories <laughs> and protectorates that were under the British. She was uh, titular head of state before mm. he got independence. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's the, the, the tradition there. Uh, but uh, I, I think they, these, we have to look at what uh, the, the constitutional rights of the prime minister are in England, mm -hmm. whether he can make such a proposal to the queen. The queen merely assents to the, you know, the executive decisions of uh, the, you know, the executive yeah. or yeah, then the queen will assent. The queen herself does not exercise executive powers. She mm. doesn't. Right. We must make that very clear. Right. The queen does not ex exercise executive powers. It's the prime minister. So he can me merely recommend for a nominal or sort of ceremonial gesture to assent. But the queen, the in fact, uh, yeah. appoints the prime minister. It's, it's, it's tradition, yes. That's the tradition. That's the tradition. <laughs> that's, and that's what we had in Zimbabwe when Mugabe became prime minister. Kenan Banana was president. Correct. You know, until, you know, Zimbabwe reversed the process. But was a ceremonial president. Was exactly like the queen. Was a ceremonial president. That is correct. Yeah. Let me come to you, uh, Dr. Obi. Earlier, you talked about uh, the importance of uh, checks and balances. You talked about uh, the three branches of government in order for democracy to really work very well. What about the fact that uh, those three type of branches uh, are very much present in most African countries, but that in most African countries, in practice, it is the executive, actually, which controls both the judiciary and the legislature. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would um, say something about the Magna Carta and then go into the question you just asked. I think that the whole point of having strong institutions, strong and effective institutions, is a very good point. However, I would say that to realize the kind of ideals that the Magna Carta stood for. Note that the Magna Carta was really between a king and rebel barons. Uh, you need to have citizens. So African simple people or the African masses need to be full citizens with full citizenship rights. Uh, citizens are able to claim rights, particularly political rights, but people who do not have citizenship rights are marginalized and put at a disadvantage in claiming such rights. There are various reasons why people may not be able to claim their citizenship rights, ranging from issues of history, issues of minority identities of different kinds, issues of poverty, and so people are more interested in the day-to-day -day existence and are not really looking, uh, are not really too much involved in voting. And sometimes, uh, some people have even gone to the extent of saying that uh, apathy is a result of people not seeing any real choices between the leading candidates in elections, or what uh, a particular Nigerian, econ uh, sorry, a particular African economist calls choiceless democracies, democracies that really offer no choice. Back to your point about the separation of powers, that is the idea. For democracies to really function, the separation of powers is the ideal. However, in some countries, depending on the kind of political system they operate, be it parliamentary or be it presidential, it does have implications for the power that the executive wields, particularly if the executive has control over economic power. 
it can leverage economic power to a great extent in its relationship with the other arms. The other issue has to do with loyalty to the political party. When a party is in majority and members are in parliament and as well as in the executive and constitute the majority in parliament, party loyalty counts for something. Thirdly, when citizens are in such a position that they are not able to participate in actual decision making, but only stop short of participation during elections, then you see a situation in which impunity begins to creep in in terms of the executive accumulating so much power at the expense of the other arms. However, I would say that rather than see this as a problem, the challenge is to see how the other arms can be empowered. And it takes an alert and committed citizenry to be able to insist on certain standards that the other arms of government should actually play their role. Um, so you are right to, to the extent that some countries do suffer from this, but it's not, uh, it's not an irreversible situation. It's a situation that can be re reversed. And lastly, history is also very important. A lot of us tend to forget the history of some of our countries, that these are democracies that not too long ago existed in countries that were either authoritarian one-party states or military states. And there is a legacy. Uh, there is a political legacy coming out of this. Indeed, some of the military governments and the authoritarian governments actually were able to influence the succession or the transition process, uh, whether it's from military to civilians or whether it was from a single party to a multi-party state. In fact, in some cases, the people who came to lead the new multi-party uh, systems, the, the, the members of the opposition who won elections and became uh, the new presidents or the new prime ministers, were actually members of the old one-party states. And as you can imagine, uh, sometimes political habits die hard. <laughs> and some of this uh, has survived into the current system. So what I would say is that we will need an effective uh, citizenry, a vigilant citizenry, to begin to make uh, some of the, ref to begin to push for some of the reforms that will actually uh, recalibrate the system to ensure good, the kind of balancing that we need. A very good point there. Unfortunately, time happens not to be our best ally. You are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa, and we'll have more of a discussion in a moment. So please don't go away, because we'll be right back with you. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about, sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams-Fitzpatrick. And Hadiza Kiari. And Ayan Bior. And Orion Itangishaka. It's time for Our Voices. Today's youth are not just the next generation of African leaders, they are today's leaders. And this is the time to invest in them, today, not tomorrow. So let's connect, let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 1730 UTC, right here on The Voice of America. We appreciate all of the audience feedback and the Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. You can watch our show and leave a comment. Now let's look at what's on top for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa.
Education has the power to transform the lives of people worldwide, especially in Africa. But often, educational practices are outdated and not student-centered. Rethinking education on the next Straight Talk Africa. And today we are discussing the process of democracy on the continent. Our guests are Dr. Kenneth Mwenda and Dr. Siru Obi. Well, I have to say again, uh, Dr. Kenneth Mwenda and Dr. Siru Obi, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to be able to host you on Straight Talk Africa today. You're most welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're most welcome, Obi. Um, Dr. Obi, uh, the last time he talked, he left on a very interesting point. The point of the need for citizenship participation in order for you uh, to ensure that you do indeed have a democracy. Now, when you talk <coughs> about citizenship, first of all, you have to have a population that happens to be socially and politically conscious, happens to be conscious, aware of its rights. And the only way they can do that is to become beneficiaries of some kind of civic education. Because when you talk about uh, citizenship, you're talking about people who owe allegiance to the state and therefore have constitutional rights, have inalienable rights. You could even say birth rights for that matter. They are the primary stakeholders really in this business. But for the most part, it seems to me that when you go across the continent, most of the countries, Africans are not citizens. They are subjects because a subject owes allegiance to an individual authority, does not also have constitutional rights, except in fact may expect privileges from that particular individual authority who happens to be in power. It could be a presidential monarch, it could be, in fact, a monarch or an emperor, for that matter. So when you talk about most countries in Africa, are African citizens or are they, in fact, subjects? Good question, Shaka. Um, first of all, yes, let me pick up where my colleague Cyril left over. Uh, the concept of citizenship, both in political science and in constitutional law, uh, does not sort of exist in the abstract. It has to be tied into civic education. It's very, very important. Um, the consciousness enlightenment of the masses. Now, when we talk of civic education, uh, you look at uh, you know, the state of our economies. On the one hand, we have what we call political democracy, and there's also the issue of economic democracy. We have done well with liberalizing markets as part of the move from a one-party state into multi-party politics. Mm. But that is not an end itself. It's mm. a means to democracy. Uh, and therefore, we need to move forward now to start building institutions. Who controls the past? Yeah, exactly. And when you talk of civic education, it starts in, in most of these developed countries, the constitution is taught in elementary, primary, uh, right. school, high school. It is but, a part of socialization. It's part of, it's part of socialization. And even the jurisprudence of human rights, you know, there's what we call the first generation of human rights yes. and the second generation of human rights. Yes. Now, let me not be, become too cop... Citizens, I don't wanna... in fact, become the frontline troops exactly in terms of defending their rights so the, the defending their country yeah so the second not the army not the police exactly so what you find in the constitution men is the first generation of human rights the bill of rights then you have these other human rights we call the second generation social economic cultural rights okay now these are pretty hard even to enforce but they are within the bedrock of democracy. And that's why we spoke about the concept of open govern mm. government. Mm. The citizens need to have access to data to hold their elected officials accountable. They need to know what their they rights to are in order to are. assert them. Exactly. These things shouldn't be a myth. You know, so there's an element of transparency, due process of the law, rule of law. You don't have laws which are re retroactive or target individuals. That sort of, even the way you enact constitutions or amend constitutions, you know, there has to be due process of the law. And when we say due process of the law, we are not just saying legality. No, there are, there, there's a difference between legitimacy and legality. You can have somebody doing things in accordance with the law, 
but the intent with which the procedure is used to achieve an end mm. does not indicate a bona fide intent whatsoever. And what about the role of the police, for example? Because one finds that in most African countries, you actually have a police force, which is pretty much similar to what used to happen under colonialism. And yet, the police should be a service to the people, protecting the people. But in this particular case, the police plays a partisan role, uh, yeah, protecting it, those in power. You know, it's speaking, as a, uh, speaking as a lawyer, indeed, you're absolutely right, Shaq, I agree with you. But if I take off my lawyer hat and speak as a political scientist, state machinery, the police are part of state machinery together with the army. Okay, that's how the state actually holds on control and obtains legitimacy. There are basically two ways in which the state will control and gain legitimacy. One, through uh, use of force. Coercion. A coercion. The other one is through um, articulating an ideology Taxation. around which they can uh, galvanize support, okay? And that's where you get a lot of propaganda, propaganda. So far, you know, to give yourself legitimacy. So most of these governments, that's what we are seeing. So the police, the police force, legally speaking, yes, they're supposed to be a service, but there's also the political reality. You know, the, 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 who appoints the inspector general of the police, you know, you know who does, the tenure of office, who fires him, all those things. So you find that these guys are not very independent. Their, their uh, tenure is somewhat, uh, you know, not secure. So, But then the question actually becomes is, who is in charge of a country? Who is the primary stakeholders, really, in a country? Is it the people or is it the guys who are in power, controlling the state. Under Montesquieu's theory of doct the doctrine of separation of powers, like Cyril pointed out, there are three things. Uh, you have the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. But I must point out something. The doctrine of separation of powers is not an absolute doctrine. It's a relative doctrine. So there are checks and balances, and sometimes there are overlaps. Even here in the US, for example, you may find that the president nominates somebody who's going to be a judge the judiciary. One would say, why is the executive encroaching in activities of the judiciary? Why don't we have a judicial service commission to appoint a judge? So those type of arguments. Uh, right now in Zambia, for example, I don't want to go into details because there's a, court, there's a case before the constitutional court where uh, parliament has said, despite the fact that the Law Association of Zambia has taken to the constitutional court a petition to throw out uh, the proposed bill, bill number 10, to amend the constitution, Parliament has said it will proceed because, it's, you know, there's a concept that Parliament is mm. sovereign and by itself. Then. Mm. Uh, so how do you reconcile? And indeed, Parliament has a lot of immunity, including immunity against defamation. Whatever is said in Parliament, you cannot sue a parliamentarian. They enjoy those common law uh, immunities. So how do you deal with those type of uh, situations? It's but, not an encroachment on the powers of the judiciary. Uh, but again, I don't want to... Preempt mm. these cases because you can be cited for contempt of court. There's, there's a doctrine <laughs> of sub judice. So very, I'll just leave it there. Very interesting. And after yeah. all, you also happen, some say, uh, to be a beneficiary of the highest honor of the Republic of Zambia bestowed upon you by President Lunga, the head of state. By the way, congratulations yes, on that. Thank you so much, Chuck. Uh, I'm, indeed, I'm eternally grateful to His Excellency the President. Uh, Dr. Ed Edgar Chagwa Lungu, he, for the honor that uh, he bestowed on me as, um, because the presidential insignia of meritorious achievement, yeah. that's the award that I received. But uh, why is it that uh, there are some people who are a little bit concerned about that? Uh, a Dr. Kenneth Mwenda being associated with the President of the Republic? Well, first and foremost, uh, we are both lawyers, number one. And we are both advocates of the High Court of Zambia, meaning to say, I am under oath to defend and protect the Constitution of the Republic of Zambia. And in all my activities, I am an officer of the court. Even though I'm based in Washington, I'm still an officer of the High Court. You mean and, in Zambia, the Constitution cannot be amended so as to remove term limits and uh, age caps? There is a procedure. There is a procedure. It can, it can be amended. There is a procedure which is spelled out in the Constitution. Um, but like I say, these are discussions which are now before the Constitutional Court, right, so we right. cannot sort of delve into details. Very interesting. Um, yes. Let me come to you, uh, Dr. Obi. Uh, he talked about uh, things to do with the propaganda in as far as the state control is concerned. And there happens to be a question from uh, the Republic of Ghana, uh, from Darafu Paul, uh, who says,
that the challenges for democracy in Africa are the abuse of power and what he calls an overdose of freedom of speech and the manipulation of the media. How do you react to that? Well, that's a legitimate view to hold. Um, but it's very difficult to pin down uh, the challenge of democracy to a few things. Uh, it's, as I said at the beginning, democracy is work in progress. The point about citizenship, uh, as my colleague uh, mentioned, is a very important one. Mm. People need to be conscious and they need to be aware. And they need to see themselves as being part and parcel of the state to which they belong to. Because that state protects them, it takes care of their fundamental human needs and welfare, and it guarantees them a future and also for their children a future. Part of the crisis we have is that increasingly the distance between the people and the state is widening. And this is because we also need to pay attention to the economic dimensions of democracy. What we do not really pay attention to most of the time is that the history of democracy had an economic component. And because of the way democracy came to Africa, historically after colonialism, Africa could not replicate the same conditions for the kind of democracy that we had in Europe, North America, and places like Australia. So that economic gap is also there. And so when we talk about the challenges and the question of the freedom of speech, yet the freedom of speech sometimes is abused, and that is why we have institutions. It is the responsibility of institutions to take care of those that tend to abuse the freedom of speech. And I'm sure my colleague understands and he appreciates that um, institutions exist to play a role. But there is a challenge in Africa. The whole question of the gap between the very rich and the very poor is something that has implications for the ability of people to even begin to ask for their rights. They want bread. And if you look at how the protests in Sudan started, it was all about bread. And if you look at the, 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 the protests of the 1990s that eventually led to, to a wave of democracies across uh, Africa, it was all about bread. So democracy in Africa needs to have a human face. It needs to have a people's face. Uh, people need to eat. People need to know that when they come out of school, they will get a job that can cover their basic needs. Uh, people want to see a future for their children that is better for them. Wait so a minute, those, those wait a minute, issues. Obi. Aren't you likely to fall into the trap of some undemocratic African leaders? Some would, in fact, uh, prefer to call them rulers, <laughs> who sometimes say to their people, ask them questions whether, in fact, they can eat democracy, that what they need is service delivery, as if, in fact, the two, democracy and service delivery, were mutually exclusive rather than being mutually, perhaps, reinforcing. Yes, I'd I like you for bringing me back to reality. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, that, your point You're is welcome. very valid. Mm -hmm. Your point is very valid, but uh, that's not the sense in which I'm taking democracy to be. I mean, democracy is about freedom. Fundamentally, it's about freedom. Uh, what we see a lot of the time is that people focus on the political aspect of uh, democracy. There is an economic aspect of the freedom that democracy should uphold. And my point simply is that political and economic freedom and justice needs to come together for you to actually enjoy the fruits of democracy. Uh, it's like, I will give you the example of a bird. Uh, 
a bird flies with two wings. It cannot fly with one wing. The democracy bird cannot fly on the political wing alone. There has to be an economic wing. And that economic wing needs to have a social face. You bring now, policies. People, you have to come up with the policies that create jobs. Yes. And, and that's the economic freedom I'm talking about. Um, you need to come with policies that create jobs. But you need to be able to control your economy to be able to, produce, to create those jobs. Uh, part of the challenge we have is that Africa, some African countries rely on one export commodity. And that export commodity, the prices fluctuate from year to year. The other thing, of course, is economic management, how governments manage the economy, which goes back to the question of accountability, which goes back to democracy once again. So you begin to see how the economic and the political are actually interlinked and integrated. And it's very difficult to separate them. So my point is this, that in paying attention to the political, economic participation, economic justice are very fundamental for people to evolve fully as citizens. Because citizenship is the bedrock of democracy in our time and at the level of economic development that we have found ourselves, we cannot afford to build a democracy on abstractions. It has to be a democracy that people can feel, that they can sense, that they can relate to, and that relates to their quality of life. Very interesting. Uh, uh, Dr. Mwenda, Dr. Obi, I think, uh, makes a very good point. Uh, but what about the fact that uh, when politicians are running for office, someone said that, in fact, they do it in poetry. They promise, for example, heaven on earth. <laughs> but when they are elected or when they rig themselves into office when, and begin the business of governing or ruling, that one, it is said, they do it in prose. Good question, Shaka. Um, it's not unusual for Africa. You know, this thing happens globally. Politicians. I said politicians. Yes, it's not <laughs> unusual. It's not peculiar to Africa. Correct. Uh, we see this even in the Western world. But at least um, in some, in the Western world, at least the leaders are held accountable. But, but not in By the citizens or the it's, media. We just don't want to mention names, but you yes. know things they say during campaigns. And yes. uh, how, how, to what extent they, those are, you know, promises are fulfilled. That is very true, yeah. but at least for them, they have the luxury of having strong institutions. Correct. And also Correct. being societies, Correct. in fact, that are governed by laws. Correct. In fact, I wanted Not to by pick, men uh, or it, women. Related to that, I wanted to pick up on a point my colleague Cyril made uh, mm -hmm. on the issue of justice. Mm. Uh, there are two forms, two strands of justice, what we call distributive justice and rest restorative justice. Now, one of them is how people can gain benefits uh, from, you know, the, the judicial system in terms of what their rights and entitlements. Mm -hmm. Restor restorative justice is correction of wrongs, you know, um, how we, we can restore. Uh, so that's part of democracy. So when you have a situation... And that can be done by an independent judiciary. Precisely. Now, when you have promises being made during election campaigns and so forth, uh, you know, the people, that's why we need civic education. The people need to be aware. Next time we have elections, can we elect such a leader? Okay. There, there are a lot of unrealistic promises. Sometimes you don't even have to subject them to scrutiny or common sense where, mm. you know, this is not attainable. Mm. Where somebody tells you in 90 days I'm going to do this, in 90 days I'm going to do that. 90 days, come on, that's three months. What, what are you about buying votes? Buying votes mm. with the sugar, buying votes with the salt, with the soap. Again, it comes back to issue of institutions, anti-corruption uh, agencies that we have to deal with those type of issues. When we're dealing with problem with corruption is that, um, first of all, corruption in many countries is a predicate offense of money laundering. So you can actually um, trigger money laundering laws as well. Mm. Now, the problem with the issue of corruption is there's very limited political will to fight corruption in Africa. Why? From the executive, because there are a lot of stakeholders. You can, you can run the whole country down. Because there's corruption, in fact, which helps them to stay in power. There's, there are a lot of stakeholders. Based on um, political patronage. Especially what we call PEPs, uh, <laughs> politically exposed persons. Mm -hmm. uh, these are in strategically positioned uh, 
uh, uh, situation. That's why you find the opposition constantly making noise and wanting to get into government immediately because the t time is running for them to eat as well. You know, so it, 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 it's, 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 it's a, there's a whole mess. There's a lot of pretense that we are pushing democracy whilst their personal interests. So sometimes even the opposition is not inspiring. It's not a question of changing government. If, can, you, if it is allowed, if it is allowed in have, any political can, space at all. Yeah, exactly. You can have two evils. Mm. You know, you can have those in government are not doing what they're supposed to do. Even those in opposition, they don't have a right agenda. But you have situations, my friend, uh, in certain African countries where, yes, on paper, in the theory, you are looking at a multi party sort of dispensation. Correct. But in the reality, you are looking at multi partyism essentially operating on a one-party state template. Yes, what we call... Where, in fact, there is hardly any difference between the ruling party right. and the state. Yes, the two are fused. What we call dictatorship of parliament, uh, where you have the ruling party has a majority seats in parliament, mm -hmm. and it's uh, very difficult, of course, for the opposition to have a voice. And the guys um, in power like to compete yeah. uh, every five years or right. four years. They yeah. say that... Uh, it, they it, hold periodical it, elections, it, it, and they like to compete against people whom they make sure yeah. their hands are tied behind their backs in, in fact, and I, their feet are tied together. I would go so far in saying uh, not only in Africa or Asia or any other developing country, including the Western world, including the U.S., uh, parliamentarians need to have fixed terms of office, uh, just like a head of state. You can't have somebody who's been a senator forever for life or a parliamentarian for life. Uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Mm. Uh, they have to have two terms, three terms, they're out, other people come in. But let's, um, let's deal with our own situation first, especially yeah. the presidents. Yes. Why, in fact, I mean, when they start, you know, when these people are sworn into office, Correct. what do they say when they're holding the constitution or the Bible? Oh, when or they're the taking Quran, off, yes, of course. When they pledge there, there's a pledge yes, to protect off. Defend. To preserve, to defend yes. the constitution of the right. republic. Exactly. And the next day, they are the ones, in fact, who are in the front line of making sure that there is this business called uh, the shifting of constitutional political goalposts. Yeah, I mean, why, why, why does the world, the international community, continue doing business as usual with those type of people? Because, frankly, to me. It seems that you are looking at some kind of coup here, a sort of coup, right. without necessarily an AK-47. And yet, <laughs> we should pay tribute to the international community and the African Union, for example, for making sure that when a soldier wakes up very early, earlier than others, and say, goes to the nearest radio station and announce announces that he has taken over for whatever reason, nobody is willing to continue doing business with that person. Yeah. Why can't the international community do the same thing? If you change the constitution for personal or political gain, we are not going to do business with you. If you hold an election that whose results do not reflect the will of the people, we are not going to do business with you. Thank you, Shaka. Let me start first of well, all. Well, unfortunately, I am told that uh, we have time is not okay. our best ally. Great. Next time. Okay. Well, on that note, uh, our distinguished guests are Kenneth Mwenda and in New York, Cyril Obi. Thanks to our audience for tuning into Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better, Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.